that. And perfect. All righty. So basically, we're in the study of Joshua, obviously, chapters uh, nine, and we're going to go through chapters 15. But let us recap before we get into today's and tonight's study. So just have a couple of just kind of brain teasers, a couple of questions to ask. And starting with question one. Why did it take two campaigns for the army of Israel to defeat I? So remember back in our last study, we were talking about that battle. And basically there were two, uh, they went out to I the first time, were defeated. And then of course they went out to I the second time and they won. But why did it take two campaigns for the armies of Israel to defeat them? Because the first one, um, they had been disobedient or someone in the group had been disobedient and taken some things that they weren't supposed to. That is correct. So exactly. Aiken, remember? So because yes. of what Aiken did, it took them a second time. And what they had to do is totally cut Aiken off, of course. And so now when they went to I again, they totally defeated him. So yes, that is correct. And then secondly, what was the difference between the battle at Ai and in the battle at Jericho? There was a specific thing that made it different. Actually, what God told them, a specific thing that he allowed for the second battle. Hmm. Remember, there was in Jericho, Achan did something against what God wanted him to do. Remember, God said, take all the gold oh. and all the spoil that was going to go yeah. into the storehouse of Israel, but right. for the battle of Ai, what did he allow? He told them that they can carry off all the plunder and livestock for themselves. They, exactly. So that was the difference. Remember, Jericho, don't touch anything. This is sacred. This is of the Lord's. Achan did. Obviously, there were consequences. But in Ai, basically, he said, anything that you want as far as this plunder, the livestock, you can take. So that was the difference between it. So yes. And then lastly, after the second campaign and the ultimate defeat of I, what did Joshua do? This was toward the end of that ninth chapter. Uh, cha what, did, what did he do? Um, he, well, um, that's where he um, built an altar. Was mm -hmm. that built an altar and then he read the, from the law, the law of Moses, mm -hmm. uh, read the laws to the people. Uh, right. So, so basically, he obviously built an altar, altar. They gave God the credit for the battle. So they ensured that this wasn't their, their doing. It was God's doing, turning the people's minds from all the defeat of the battle to what God had done and what God is doing for them. So, yes, that's exactly. So just wanted to kind of get our mindset back into the study so we can actually Go forth and see what God has for us in tonight's study. So basically, we're looking at chapter nine now. We read some of it, so I'm going to read it pretty quickly to catch us up so we can get to the point where we'll start tonight. And it says, now when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things, the kings in the hill country, in the western foothills, and along the entire course of the Mediterranean Sea, as far as Lebanon, the kings of the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. They came together to wage war against Joshua and Israel. However, when the people of Gibeon heard that Joshua had, what had, had done to, Is, to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks and wine, old wineskins, cracked and mended. They put worn and patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes. All the bread of their food supply was dry and moldy. Then they went to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal and said to him and the Israelites, we have come from a distant country, make a treaty with us. So remember last time in our last meeting toward the end, we started opening up about this new chapter. And we find out that the success of Joshua and his men was over the whole area. And so a lot of people were afraid. A lot of people were at arms. What are we going to do? We can't fight this great army. So the Gibeonites were crafty. And we said, basically, they, uh, in essence, tricked the uh, Israelites. And what they did was they were literally neighbors to them. 
but they came dressed as if they were from a far country and had, you know, been a far, you know, from a far area where they had a delegation, donkeys that had worn out sacks and old wineskins. And they told this to Joshua and his men. So needless to say, this catches us up now to the seventh verse, seven through 13. And will someone please just read for me verses seven through 13. Sure, I'll take it. Thank you. The Israelites said to the Hivites, but perhaps you live near us. So how can we make a treaty with you? We are your servants. They said to Joshua, but Joshua asked, who are you and where do you come from? They answered, your servants have come from a very distant country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of him, all that he did in Egypt and all that, excuse me, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites east of Jordan. Sihon, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, who reigned in Ashtaroth. And our elders and all those living in our country said to us, take provisions for your journey and go meet them and say to them, we are your servants, make a treaty with us. This bread of ours was warm when we packed it at home on the day we left to come to you. But now see how dry and moldy it is. And these wineskins that we filled were new, but see how cracked they are. And our clothes and sandals are worn out by the very long journey. Gotcha. So we see the whole idea of the ruse. We see them basically setting up this whole uh, story to kind of fool the Israelites. And it's funny, the Israelites even kind of questioned, which they should have went a little further. They said, yes, but perhaps you live near us. How can we make a treaty with you? So they already had some apprehension about it, but they still let these people kind of fool them and put them in a trick bag. Mm -hmm. So they said, oh no, we're your servants. And we heard of all these wonderful things that happened. And we talked to our elders and they said that, you know, you need to go be, you know, meet these people. And so we went on this great journey and when we had bread, it was warm, but now it's moldy. We had these cloths and these packs and now they're all worn and we had this wine and we were gonna bring it all in. But now since we've come so far, everything has spoiled because we were on a great journey. So they're just literally setting the stage. So next we see what they, what they did. So will someone just please read for us um, verse uh, Joshua chapter 9 verses 14 and let's just end at verse 19 actually okay i'll read it pastor Mm 14 the israelites sampled their provisions but did not inquire of the lord then joshua made a treaty of peace with them to let them live and the leaders of the assembly ratified it by oath three days after they made the treaty with the gibeonites the israelites heard that they were neighbors living near them. So the Israelites set out and on the third day came to their cities, Gibeon, Kephra, Baroth, and Kirath Jerem. But the Israelites did not attack them because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders, but all the leaders answered, we have given them our oath by the Lord, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. This is what we will do to them. We will let them live so that God's wrath would not fall on us for breaking the oath we swore to them. They continued, let them live, but let them be woodcutters and water carriers in the service of the whole assembly so the leader's promise to them was kept. Wow, so we see how it totally unfolds. Mm -hmm. So they said, okay, the Israelites sampled their provisions but did not inquire of the Lord. So that's definitely a big thing that we have to look at with this. So just because of that, Joshua made the treaty. They're not gonna attack these people. Then three days later, they found out the truth and obviously definitely started getting a little buyer's remorse. They found out that these people live right next door to them. So they went to them, but they couldn't do anything because they had sworn an oath to them. Right. And basically, if they'd done this, this was something that they swore before God himself. So they couldn't attack him. All they could do is grumble. All they could do is complain. 
But then they said that because you did this, because you tricked us, you will be our servants as you wanted to, but you're going to be woodcutters and water carriers for the whole assembly. It said, so the leaders kept their promise. And of course, that promise was kept. But let's see what Joshua says to these guys. So will someone please read for us verses 22 and go down to verses 27. Then, oh, oh. Yeah. then Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said, why did you deceive us by saying we live a long way from you while actually you live near us? You are now under a curse. You will never be released from service as woodcutters and water carriers for the house of my God. They answered Joshua, your servants were clearly told how the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you the whole land and to wipe out all its inhabitants from before you. So we feared for our lives because of you. And that is why we did this. We are now in your hands. Do to us whatever seems good and right to you. So Joshua saved them from the Israelites and they did not hurt them. <laughs> I <get> covered. <laughs> oh, kill them. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that day he made the Gibeonites woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly to provide for the needs of the altar of the Lord at the place the Lord would choose. And that is what they are to this day. Gotcha. So Joshua then stands up and says, hey, why did you deceive us? You know, you told us you lived way over here, but we find out you live right next door to us. And so basically he says that you clearly, uh, we were, you know, they said, well, we had heard all these bad things. You know, we'd heard how your God did this and your God had done that. And then how your God had commanded his soul, Moses, uh, you know, to wipe out all the inhabitants. So we feared for our lives. But then they say this, which is very unique. They know they had done the deception, but they said, do to us whatever seems good and right to them. And it's funny because they act like Joshua had a true choice. He really didn't. He couldn't kill him because he'd already sworn an oath to him. So right. all he really could do was just put him into that servitude. So, of course, then he said on that day, the Gibeonites became woodcutters and water carriers for the assembly. Now, when you hear that, you say, oh, that doesn't seem like a bad punishment. But remember, you're taking care of those total people. So if they needed lodging, you had to cut the wood for them. If they needed water in their area, you had to do that for them. So this basically was a low job in the camp, but it was their recompense from not being killed by the Israelites. So this leads us to study question two. And it says, what mistake did the men of Israel make in dealing with the Gibeonites? But before we answer this, let us look to another piece of scripture to help with the answer. So let us look at Genesis 16 and 17. So let, oh, well, actually it's Genesis 1, 16 and 17, but let, let, let us read this. And it says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. So we all are familiar with this story. Obviously the patriarch of the Israelite people Abram, obviously his name wasn't yet Abraham, and his wife Sarai, who her name wasn't yet Sarah, were in a foreign land. They had a no heirs. So they really wanted to have an heir because in those days, it, it was extremely important to have someone you could pass your land to, your goods to. So they concocted a scheme. And that scheme was, though Sarah couldn't give birth, her handmaid could. So Abram, sleeps with her handmaid, and of course, she conceives. But we know that obviously this whole situation is problematic. So it leads to our next verses that I want to read. And could we read Genesis 17, 15 through 19? Could someone read that for us, please? God also said to Abraham, as for the Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarah. 
her name will be Siri. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and whole. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, to himself, will your son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And will Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessings, then God said, yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him and as an everlasting covenant of his descendant after him. So we see the completion in this story. First, we saw in chapter 16 that Sarah and Abram and Hagar concocted a plan. And that plan was to do what? To bring forth an heir. They hadn't seen that they were able to do it, so they took it upon themselves to do it. But now we see this, what God wants to do in the life of these individuals. So God now is talking to Abraham, and he says, Obviously, he's changing their names. Remember now, instead of Abram, who would be father of nations, he'd be Abraham, father of many nations. Sarah would now be, Sarah would now become Sarah. And he told them that I'm going to bless you, that you too will conceive, not the child Ishmael. Obviously, that was conceived with your handmaid, but I want a child from you two to have, to, to start the nations of Israel. And of course, what did Abraham do when he heard this from God? What did he do? He laughed. He laughed. How could a man who was 100 years old and a woman who was 90 years old give birth to a child? Now, they had been in this foreign land for a while. They had been here all that time and never anything came up. But why in their old age? <clears throat> when God wants to do something, God will do it. Amen. Mm -hmm. So he said, yes, she will. And, that's, and it will be with this son that I will establish my covenant. So this is why we wanted to bring about these two pieces of scripture. So I said, let us compare. In both instances, there was one thing that each group, Abraham and Sarah, and the men of Israel did not do. What was that? Ask God. Exactly. They didn't talk with God. Very profound, very important. They didn't consult with God in their decision-making process. And obviously we see just because they didn't do that, what things went awry. Mm -hmm. we see, of course, in our study tonight and looking at Joshua that they made an agreement and a covenant with people they probably should have wiped out. But right. instead of consulting God first, they said, and, and they even, they've been questioning it. I mean, it was in their mind to do it. They said, well, how do we, aren't you, you know, from the country next door? But then they let these smooth talkers just keep talking and keep letting it go in. And then they didn't think about, hey, maybe we should talk to God about this situation. So it leads to just a question for the group tonight. What about us? Are there times in your life when you don't consult the Lord? And then when you didn't do that, what happened? Did you, did you have to reap some unfortunate consequences? So this is a question to pose out. Are, are there times when that's happened to us? Anybody? <laughs> Don't look at me. I'm pretty sure we all had those instances, you know, because in certain things, especially like, i.e., they wanted to have a, a son, or these people just wanted to make sure that they could, they said they would be my servants. They just wanted to get it done and over with. And sometimes in our lives, we get in that rush to where we just want to get it done and over with. And our thought process isn't, let's pray about it. You know, let's see what God says about it. Let's see what answer he's going to bring for it. Because if they had done that, imagine a different outcome. Yeah. Now, one thing I like about God, he's sovereign. So even though they made mistakes, Abram, Abraham, and Sarah, 
he still made a son come forth that he would make a mighty nation. But he also made a nation out of the illegitimate son. So he did double for the trouble, of course, that was caused. Also with the men of Israel. Yes, they had made an agreement with these, these group of people, but now they had people who would build the, who would cut the wood, who would bring the water. So they had extra people to help out. Because remember, they were pure at the time. We talked about the only foreigners that were with them were uh, Rahab's family. So now they've incorporated the Gideonites, uh, Gibeonites, excuse me, into their group. Questions before we go further. Any comments? Well, my, the only comment I had was in reference to, you know, the um, statement here where, where it says, are there times in your life when you did not consult the Lord? I mm -hmm. think sometimes we, we may consult God, but we don't wait for the answer. <laughs> Amen. You know? You, you kind of still take it upon yourself and, and rather than waiting to hear from him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen, great point, great point. Other thoughts? All right, let us go forth. Next, to study question three. Now, because of their deception, what did the Israelites do to the Gibeonites? What was their punishment? You just said it. They were made to be woodcutters and water carriers for the well, the uh, camp. That's it. Yeah, it, it's found in Joshua nine twenty through twenty one, and you can use that as your reference when you place it on your on your paper. It mm -hmm. says, "This is what we will do with them. We will let them live, so that God's wrath will not fall on us for breaking the oath we swore to them." They continue, "Let them live." but let them be woodcutters and water carriers in the service of the whole assembly. So the leader's promise to them was kept. And as you said, they made them woodcutters and water carriers, our servants to the entire community. Mm -hmm. Everyone got it down? Got it. Good deal. All right, let us go. So now we've left Joshua 9. We find out that Joshua 9 basically kind of chronicles the deception of the Gibeonites. And we find out because of their deception, what eventually happened to them. You know, they are part of the tr that grouping, but they are now, in essence, the water carriers, the lowest on the totem pole in that society. But now we have some other folks that are finding out about the exploits of the children of Israel. And I would have someone just please read for us verses, uh, Joshua 10, verses one through four. One through what? One through four, please. One through four. Mm -hmm. um, now, Adonai mm -hmm. Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and had become their allies. He and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than I, and all of its men were good fighters. So Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron, Hiram, king of Jarmuth, Japhia, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. All right. So now we have another group that's looking at the children of Israel. We first remember that the children of Israel are in a foreign land. It is a land of promise, but it still is a foreign land. Right. And before we get too deep into it, I wanted you to look at the name of this first king or this first statement. It says, now Adonai Zendek, 
king of Jerusalem. Now, wasn't Jerusalem, why would Jerusalem come against the children of Israel? Hmm. Wasn't that a sacred place or wasn't that a place that we saw a lot of Hebrew commerce or why, why at this point that Jerusalem would go against it? Wasn't that a big place to end? Obviously, as we look in the New Testament, we hear it, we see it. But why here in the Old Testament that this king of Jerusalem is fighting the Israelites or looking to pick a fight with the Israelites? Well, we remember, yes, we are in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And we remember that Jerusalem is a city that's not occupied by the Hebrews yet. Remember, the children of Israel are going forth with their mighty force. So Jerusalem is under the control of the people that were there at that time. So it's not that Israel was fighting against Israel because they hadn't they hadn't colonized it. They hadn't they haven't been there yet. They're actually going there now. But I also wanted to point out the name of this king. So we've maybe heard before, we've heard many different names of God. Basically, there's Yahweh. What are some other names that of God? Of God, mm -hmm. um, we call I him am. Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh. We have that. Yeah. We also have El. That's a name. But there's also Adonai. Have you heard that one? So we see Pardon. this king here have that name Adonai Zedek or Zedek. Why would he have that? He, of course, wasn't a God. He was, he was a man. And he definitely isn't the one living true God. So I wanted to bring this up because basically in that time and in that tongue, Adonai, we, and it's spelled differently for the name that we call God, was actually just like a nomenclature, like Lord Tuggerson, or it was basically a surname. So that's why you see it attached to this king. So basically, if we were to put it in a modern sense and obviously just using the British lead of it you know how they have lords and duchesses and dukes mm -hmm. basically it was one of those types of titles so on its face it simply means believe it or not lord of justice but the name Adonai that we use for the name of God is basically a lord of lords a plural form like he is over all of these lords and so that's the difference because we see things in the Bible, especially when we see the name Jesus was a common name. So we want to just kind of clarify those things as we see it. So remember, this was just a surname for him, like saying Lord or Duke, Emperor, things of that nature. So, and remember, at that time, the children of Israel weren't in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was just another city until they actually were able to, of course, conquer and colonize. So in this particular text, we see that this king had heard about Israel. He'd heard about their exploits before in battle. He heard how a large city made a peace treaty with them because they were afraid. So he wanted to make a coalition to actually go up against Israel. So he called upon all these other kings, five total, and he wanted them to have a coalition to join forces and so that they could go and attack Gibeon. So actually, I'm just going to read that last piece. And it says, and the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachesh, and Eglon joined forces. They moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. Why do you think they'd go there? What was their purpose for that? Why would they attack Gibeon? Well, they were mad at him for making an, a, a treaty with Israel. <laughs> well, yeah, they were, they were definitely mad. But what did they know it would do? If they attacked Gibeon, what would have to happen? The Israelites would have to fight. Yes, the Israelites would have <laughs> to respond. They'd have to. Why? Because remember, they were under their protection. They were under their treaty. They had sworn an oath to them. So yeah, they'd have to go out as well. So now we go forth and see what they did. Could someone please read for us Joshua 10 verses six and go ahead and just end uh, at verse nine. All right, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. 
the Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal, do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. Good deal. So as Deke was saying, basically, yes, they attacked Gibeon. And they knew that the Israelites had to respond. So the Gibeonites sent word to Joshua, told them about this new coalition and this new campaign that was happening with these five armies marching up against them. Remember, Joshua, they were camped in Gilgal. So they went from Gilgal to actually go out and to fight this army. So will someone please continue uh, and read verses 10 and 11. 10 and 11. The Lord mm -hmm. threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Beth Horon, and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. Mm -hmm. In verse 11. As, as they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hell than they were killed by the scores of the Israelites. Wow. So, man, what a, neat, what a neat way to see this battle. Basically, we see that the Lord actually put them in confusion because they had a huge army. You're thinking these are five large cities that are coming to attack the Israelites. So on their way to Gibeon, they were put into a little bit of a disarray. So obviously, as they were in that disarray, of course, Joshua's forces were able to come in. But what did also the hand of God do in this battle? And this is just going to be one of the things he did. What did, what did he do also? What does that last verse tell us? He sent large hailstones. He so sent the hailstones. Yeah, hailstones so beat them. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying that the hail, is the, the hail, the large hailstones basically beat them to death. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Exactly. It actually even quantifies and clarifies and said that the hailstones, actually more men were killed because of what God was doing. So he was fighting their battles. He was looking out for them. So he was ensuring and telling Joshua, I have your back undoubtedly. Not only am I going to say that, but I'm going to prove that by allowing you to win on your end, but I'm also going to allow these hailstones to come down and to usurp and fight this army. So next. Before we go further, let's just talk about Gilgal. Now, I'm not going to read the text, but do we remember this from Joshua 4 at all? Do you remember Gilgal and its significance and why they were camped there and what that meant? So remember, just putting it back in your mind, and then we're going to read it to kind of set the story. Remember, basically, they were on the eve <coughs> of battle to Jericho. Mm -hmm. And in front of them, obviously, was a large river. And it was something that they couldn't get past. So remember, they took the Ark of the Covenant. They had the priest go to the edge of the water. When they went to the edge of the water, just like it did at the Red Sea, the waters heaped up. And then the Israelites were able to walk through. So we see that as again, like Moses, Joshua had a water occurrence or a blessed water event. Mm -hmm. With that said, now we lead to where they walked on dry land. And remember, in the midst of the Jordan, they took stones. Remember, how many stones did they take? Twelve. Twelve stones representing what? Twelve tribes. Twelve tribes, Twelve tribes exactly. So now we see when they took those stones, basically, they set them up as, as a monument. And now let us just read this piece just to kind of get it back in our memory. So Gilgal, if we could read that, uh, Joshua 4, someone can just read verses 19 uh, through verses 24 for it. On the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, 
when your descendants asked their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea. When he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. Uh, he did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful, and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Gotcha. So we see that they're at this encampment, this encampment that held so much significance. Remember, the monument was there. They'd crossed the Jordan River. They'd got that protective arm from God. So that's why, of course, the Gebunites went there to go get them, get them from Gilgal so that they could fight this battle. I just wanted to bring back that significance and bring that back into our understanding of where they were and where regionally they were and how, of course, arduous this was to get together and go out and attack people. So let us just read again, going to Joshua 10, verses 12, and let us just some, someone stop at verse 15. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, Sun, stand still over Gibeon, and you, moon, over the valley of Agilent. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jashar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. So wow. So remember, not only do we see this supernatural event of God raining down hailstones, but what else took place? The sun stood still and the moon stopped. Wow. Did he? I mean, just think about that. Quantify it. It says the sun stopped in the sky. But why did it do that? Did God automatically set that up? Obviously, he automatically threw down hailstones. <laughs> well, Joshua asked him for that, right? Yes. Asked him to do that. Joshua asked him to do that. Now, just put that into quanti this quantify that. Joshua, this man, obviously leader of the Israelite people, uh, they were in a battle, obviously ready to keep fighting and to keep going on. He spoke to a holy God and look what a holy God did on his behalf. Now it says, never has there been a day like this before and a day like this since. When the Lord listened to a human being. So let me just put that into context. Because we were specifically talking about this instance with Joshua. Joshua talked to God, and he asked him to hold the sun in the sky, obviously, and delay the going, for, going down for a full day. Then it says that there's never been a day like this where God listened to a human and did this thing. But my question to you, class, is does God listen to us, and will God move for us. Yes. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> I mean, is that the consensus? Yes, no, yeah. maybe. Yeah. He listens to us. Yeah, he listens. Mm -hmm. He does. He does listen to us. And when they put in here where it says that where it never had been like this the day before when the Lord listened to a human being. God listens to human beings all the time. All the time. We are able to speak to him. We were able to talk with him. We're able to, you know, commune with him. And it's not saying that he doesn't listen to us at all. It's just basically saying that he is, he didn't do anything like this again from the voice of a human being, i.e. stop the sun from setting and allowing the moon to rise. So I want us just to make sure we look at the entire text, because sometimes people could bring out this little pieces and say, well, God doesn't listen to human beings. He listened to Joshua, and after that, he stopped listening. But I tell you, there are, I can tell you 100% that he's listening to me and things. Now, he didn't stop the moon in the sky, but he's done great works in life if you just ask and 
ask him to do it for you. And obviously you are in right relationship with him. So yes, he still listens to us and he listened to Joshua. And now let's go further. So if someone could read uh, verses uh, 15 and then complete it all the way down to verses 19, verse 19. Now the five kings had fled and hidden in the cave at Makeda, Makeda. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been found hiding in the cave at Makeda, he said, roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. But don't stop, pursue your enemies, attack them from the rear and don't let them reach their cities for the Lord your God has given them into your hand. Good deal. So obviously we see that, yes, he has them on the run. Obviously, these kings have lost and now they're hiding because they know what's going to be next. God has just totally fought for them, for, for the children of Israel. He's given them the victory and they tell him, don't give up. Don't let these guys escape. Make sure that we go after them because we have to show what God can do. Now let's look. Joshua 10 verses 20 through uh, 24. And actually, will someone take 20 through 22, and we're going to discuss that, and then we'll have someone take 23 to 24. Someone can just please that read that for us. Sure, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely, but a few survivors managed to reach their fortified cities. The whole army then returned safely to Joshua in the camp at Makeda, mm -hmm. and no one uttered a word against the Israelites. Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me. Hmm. All righty. So, so someone read 23 through 24. So they brought the five kings out of the cave. The kings of Jerusalem helped Hebron, Jarmuth, mm -hmm. Lashish, and Eglon when they had brought these kings to Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel and said to them, to the army commanders who had done, come with him, come here and put your feet on the necks of these kings. Hmm. So, they came, mm -hmm. so they came forward and placed their feet on the, their necks. Hmm. So we find out that Joshua, they, they defeated them. A few survivors made to escape back to their cities. We find those five kings are in a cave. Uh, in a cave, Joshua tells them to bring out the, ki the the kings, but then he also does something very, very unique. He summoned all the commanders of the army. So obviously, this couldn't be all the men, but just the commanders. And what did he tell those commanders to do? To put their feet on the king. The kings, yeah. Yeah, put their feet on the necks of the kings. Mm. And these were great men. These were men who controlled armies. These were men who said, you know, do this and do that. They had servants. They had townships. They had castles or forts. These five kings were great men. And these commanders are putting their feet on the necks of these kings. I'm definitely going to look at that. we got a little more to, to jump into, but we're gonna definitely going to go back to that piece. So if someone could just read for us chapter, uh, sorry, uh, verses uh, 27 uh, through 25. 25 through 27. Um, Joshua said to them, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you're going to fight. Then Joshua put the kings to death and exposed their bodies on five poles, and they were left hanging on the poles until evening. Mm. At sunset, Joshua gave the order, and they took them down from the poles and threw them into the cave where they had been hiding. At the mouth of the cave, they placed large rocks, which are there to this day. Hmm. So the commanders put, the feet, put, their, uh, put their feet on the necks of these kings. Joshua encourages says, don't be afraid, be, don't be discouraged, be strong and courageous. Now I'm gonna stop there. Have don't those words sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Where where do we first hear those words in Joshua? Who's who spoke those words? And who are they directed at? 
Lord. The Lord, exactly. And who are they directed to? Joshua. Joshua. So remember, he told Joshua, be strong, be courageous. So Joshua's just telling him that his men the exact same thing that God gave to him. He said, because this is what the Lord will do to your enemies when you're going to fight. So they, of course, they put the kings to death. They hung their body on poles and they left the poles until evening. And then, of course, at sunset, they threw their bodies back into those caves where they'd been hiding. And then, of course, placed a large rock in them, as the verse says, which are there to this day. So now let's break this down and look at study question four. And it says, who are the five kings who went to Gibeon to make war against Israel? Eglon, Lachish, Jarmuth, Hebron, and Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So the, the five kings mm -hmm. um, were, um, yeah, what was Joshua. it? I Adonized the, the deck. Mm -hmm. um, Ho Hoham. Uh, of of Hebron, mm -hmm. Piram of Jarmuth, Japhia of Lachish, and Debir of Eglon. Gotcha. So there we go. Found in Joshua ten and three, uh, all the names basically that are there, and we have those, so you can write those out. And what do we know about the Adonai piece? That was just what. For Azona Zenda. Oh, Zenda, excuse me. I didn't hear. For Azona Adonai Zenda. We know that that doesn't mean God, that this basically is more oh, of a surname for a title, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the Duke or correct, correct. Yeah. So we get those down, and then I want us to look at another aspect of this when everyone's finished with this. Do we still have people writing? Yes, sir. One more. Okay, no worries. Take your time. Okay. Thank you. Good deal. Everyone's okay? Everyone got it? Mm -hmm. All right. So we go to study question five, and we find out and ask, what was the purpose of the sun and the moon standing still over Gibeon. What was the purpose in that? Why did Joshua ask for that? Is it so that they could sure. keep fighting? You got it. That's exactly. That's exactly it. So that they could keep fighting. Were there other comments? Uh, to prolong the daylight. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have it here. It says, answer is found in Joshua 10, 12 through 14. Of course, it says, on the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon and you moon over the valley of Aligen. Excuse me. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. And it is written in the book of Jasher. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day where the Lord listened to a human being, sure that the Lord was fighting for Israel. So basically our answer is found in that saying, so that Israel could continue fighting and the victory would show that the Lord was with Israel. Did everyone get that? All right. So looking at study question six, of course, what happened to the five Amorite kings? So what, what did Joshua do? They were in a cave and what did he do? 
He told, he told the commanders of the armies to come in and put their feet on their necks. Put their feet on their necks. And then after that, what happened? He killed them. He, he killed them. Killed. Killed. Yeah, he had them killed. Put them on a pyre, hung them up. Everyone can see these kings, these great men, these great leaders of these cities. After he did that, then he threw their bodies back where? In the cave. In the cave okay. that they were hiding in. He threw them back into that. So yes. So we see that found in Joshua 10, 24 through 26. When they brought the kings of Joshua, he summoned all the men of Israel, said to the army commanders who came with him, put your feet on the necks of these kings. They came forth, put their feet on the hand of those necks. Joshua said, don't be afraid, be encouraged, uh, be bold, be courageous. And of course, then Joshua put the kings to death and exposed their bodies and, now, and left them hanging on poles. So yes. The commanders on the instruction of Joshua paced their feet on the necks of the kings and afterwards they were put to death. So remember I said I wanted to get back to that piece of standing on their necks. So what is the significance of the commanders standing on the necks of these kings? What do you think that was about? Why would Joshua go that extra mile? He could have just said, let's kill him. Let's hang him on the pile. Why, why would he go that extra piece? And what, what did that really mean? It showed dominance. It did show dominance. Yeah. D? Oh, I was going to say um, it, um, it, it, makes them, it makes them completely helpless. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Any other thoughts? Well, we've seen it, and I just like to bring it up because that, obviously I just uh, was looking. Obviously, we know that uh, Ruth Gader ben Ginsburg passed away this year, and it was funny. They had a little, uh, uh, I'd say not a show, but basically more of a docu-series on her. CNN had done it, and in that, she was in an interview. And remember, she was very a great proponent for women's rights. And she had a great little saying about telling her brethren to get their foot off the, her neck. You know, so needless to say, keeping her down, being dominant. So literally what we were saying here, as far as in, yes, it was showing a sign of dominance. These were great men in their own right, but they had been utterly defeated. And it was a show to show the people that our God, no matter where these guys, who, who these guys thought they were, no matter how bad they thought when they got this coalition together to attack the people of God, God still has the last day. He is still in control. We are mm -hmm. in control of this, not them. So yes, it was just kind of an extra, uh, an extra hit to show what was going on and the power that God had moved in the children of Israel. If you're actually just to look up that, I said the answer continues. The expression means to be victimized by someone who is controlling everything that you do and thereby preventing you to act or function normally, to hinder someone. So no longer would these kings have control, but control was given to Israel by God. So yes, we see these great victories, of course, in this, uh, this study of Joshua. Obviously, we talked about the battles of Ai. We talked about now the battles against that coalition of kings. And in every instance, God gives them the victory. But he allowed, we allowed, we are allowed and to see that it's only through God that the victory can be achieved. A lot of points were brought up. Of course, we see that um, the people who tricked Joshua obviously were attacked. So Joshua, by the oath that he had to swear to them, by he sworn to them before, had to defend him. But in their defense, God does two supernatural things. And what is that? He had the sun stand still. He had his son stand still, right? But he also did what? He had the, like the rocks and the boulders come down, right? The hail, exactly, the hail. And exactly, remember hail, that took yeah. out more, more men than, the, um, than by the sword. Yeah, by the sword. Mm -hmm. So needless to say, we see that God is taking care of them. And then we see Joshua in his leadership role, bring out the commanders, have them, not, I'm not going to say utter humiliation, but letting them know that God is more dominant than the peoples in these nations. So God is with them. Just And we learn in these lessons that it's not just for the Old Testament times, but it's also for times like and times that we live in now. 
that God is also with us. Just remember like Joshua, we just have to remember to humble ourselves and to, to ask in earnest. Look what the ask of one man did. Now, mind you, yes, it hasn't happened anymore, but I do believe that if we ask in earnest, God will still provide and take care of us and help us in our time of need. Any questions? Any comments? All right. Well, you guys have been an exciting bunch. <laughs> the time is nine, so we will definitely get started again uh, at uh, the study question seven, uh, looking at the Southern conquest of Canaan. I'm going to send out, uh, actually, next week, we will actually will not have an in-person study because it'll be right. It'll be the week of the holiday. It'll be the week following. But I will send out the study materials so that you'll have those to kind of go ahead. So when we get together, we'll still be on the same page. Good deal. All right. Anything else before we close? It's good to see everybody in a midweek. I'm glad we had the participation we had, seeing there was a a lot of us that came out, so that's very, very good. So I will definitely make sure that this does get uploaded uh, correctly so that those who couldn't join us uh, will also uh, be able to uh, get this and uh, be part of the study. Good deal. All righty. Well, thank you much. Before, uh, we close, right. before we leave, oh, just want to say something, sorry. No, no, no. Okay. Before we leave, uh, Deacon Daniels, could I ask you to close us out in prayer, please? All right. Let us pray. Father, we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for bringing us together to hear your word. We hope that you will continue to open our minds and open our hearts that we can not only hear your word, but understand it and live it. We thank you for this group. We thank you for those that were able to come out. We pray for those that may have had a mind to come out, but just couldn't make it. We ask that you continue to keep us, continue to bless us, continue to guide our steps and direct our path. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you for another chance to get closer to you, Lord. These are other blessings I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you again for coming out. And I look forward to when we can all some one day touch and agree. It'll come back soon. <laughs> <laughs> God bless you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Get Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Pastor, we'll be singing that song when we all get together. Amen. I, I do believe it, Doc. I do believe it. <laughs> what a day of rejoicing that will be yeah. when we all sing Jesus. Sing and shout the victory. <laughs> oh, man. I thank you. I thank you. Great hymn of the church. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let, definitely. Everyone be blessed. A great note to leave on. <laughs> All right, good night. Good night.